Randy Reed, editor of Designing Lighting Magazine, and I'm here at Education with Dr. Shelley James. Dr. James, welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, we call this our C-Suite series. So I'm happy to have you here, and I want to talk about your, your latest book, if I may. You have it? I certainly here do. Here to show our audience, Light, Your Essential Survival Guide. Is that a great title or what? Tell our audience a little bit about what they can find in this book. So I've been talking to professionals all over the world for several years now, and they all ask the same questions. They ask about mood, they ask about sleep, they ask about how they can focus better. And actually, most people I speak to have no idea what a difference light can make. So what I've done is to boil all that down into simple chapters, which tackle those specific topics. I've also included something about how the, uh, the eye and brain works. I put some material about lighting technologies. Most people don't understand the difference between an LED and a fluorescent, for example. And I've also put some stuff in there about when you're shopping, what, you sh what should you be looking for so that people can make a more informed choice about the lighting. Well, I'll just say I'm very blessed because I have an autograph issue and I have thumb through it. And what I like about it, you keep it in layman terms. Completely, yeah. And I just think that is so important to help people to understand it. Yeah, it's, um, what I've done is to balance the layman's terms as though I was speaking to my brother or sister, um, or some of the professionals I come across. But at the back, there's a bunch of references, and each chapter has a QR code, which takes you to a PDF with all the references that are linked. So if you want to dive into the science, you can. But if you just want to read it and get the information you need to go shopping for lights better, then that's what you get. Okay. All right, let's speak a little bit about this device that you brought here and the importance of that. Okay. So your brain isn't wired really to tell the different frequencies in a light source in the same way that it can't tell which frequencies are in a sound. You might know that it feels a bit tinny, but you might not really be able to put your finger on why. Right. And it's the same with light. And we know now that having a light source which has a good range of wavelengths, but particularly which has wavelengths in the blue part of the spectrum if you want to wake up, is really important. So most light meters will tell you how much light, how bright it looks, but they won't tell you which wavelengths are in there. So this one allows you in real time to see what the wavelengths are. So you can talk about the quality of light in a way that um, bypasses your visual perception and understands your non-visual perception too. Well, I first saw you use a similar technology uh, at a talk you gave in Poland. That's and right. it was the first time that I heard you speak and I thought it was a brilliant talk. And then of course you spoke at our Happy Circadian Hour in London, which was a very successful event. So this is a meter which has actually been um, lent to me by a company called Gigahertz, an amazing German company because I knew that I was going to be coming here to talk about the quality of light. Um, and so here we can see it's set to measure, this little sensor at the top is reading the light levels around. And this is the curve, this is the balance of wavelengths. And then if we can, we can scroll through, we can scroll through the different, so this is actually how many of different types of wavelengths there are in the light source. It will also, we can go through and look at the color rendering in more detail. We can look at the melanopic lux also, just so let me go through that again. So this is, there's a measure of biological impact of light, sort of how much it's like the coffee for the brain. And this allows us to see that melanopic EDI, which is something that you see, for example, in the well standard. So this light meter allows us to look beyond brightness to look at biological potency as well. Okay, now it's interesting, so we're here at Education, which is a, a show with strong lighting designers, and there are 450 plus exhibitors. Do you know how many light meter exhibitors there are here? Because I know. I would say there are zero. There are zero. There are zero, and I don't know that I understand why there is not more of a push that every lighting designer should carry a light meter with them like we carry a phone with us. I agree. I think it's partly because people haven't yet integrated this whole non-visual response. There are lots of gorgeous decorative lights here, and there are a few which talk about spectrum, but most of them are talking about how stuff looks, the, the visual appeal of something. Okay. So I think that 
the sector has a long way to go before it understands the power of what it's doing, actually. Well, how, how widely accepted do you see uh, circadian lighting? Do you see it beginning to be specified now? I think it depends on the sector. Okay. So I'm seeing, I'm doing a lot of work in the high-end workplace, the kind of high-performance workplace, where every hour of one of those people, or getting one of those people to come into the office is so critical that they spend a lot of time and effort making sure the workplace is optimized. So I'm seeing circadian and optimized lighting moving into that space. I'm also seeing it moving into the residential care space where we see reductions in falls, we see improvements in mood, we see reductions of sleep medication. So we can start to see a business case for that. Um, and I'm also working in the special needs sector where people with autism, uh, other learning difficulties really notice the difference between a well-designed and calibrated lighting system that supports the body clock and one that is bog standard really. I visit the uh, Delta Terminal at LaGuardia Airport, okay. and they have an area for those type of children. And they are using light to kind of calm the children in an airport, because yeah. an airport is a stressful place, and especially if you suffer from autism. And uh, I just thought it was brilliant what I saw in there. So I do think that we are seeing more of it, but we're not seeing enough of it. Not yet, not yet. But I think that the innovators and those who are keen to have a, a, a commercial advantage of starting to embrace some of these strategies. Okay. But I think maybe we should just differentiate between light sources which allow you to create different atmospheres and those which actually have enough of a brightness during the day, for example, to create that circadian stimulus. So there's, there's, a, there's a slight, one is a subset of the other. Right, exactly. Okay, closing comments? Um, it's an exciting time to be working in lighting, really. And I guess the other, the other thing may be that the future is controls. So how exciting is it to be here and surrounded by all this exciting tech? Thank right. you for the opportunity. Right. Where can people find your book? They can find it online on Amazon. Just look for Dr. Shelley, uh, James, and Light Your Essential Survival Guide. You'll find that. Thank you very much. All right, Shelley. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure.